So yes, thank you very much for the um, the introduction. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here to speak to the NLG community. Um, what I thought I'd do today, um, instead of diving into specific applications, um, et cetera, et cetera, I thought I'd go through seven characteristics that I believe, uh, in my experience, help to make data to, sec data to tech systems effective for end users. So, you know, my original remit when I was asked to talk was give an industry um, perspective on NLG. Um, so I think many of you will be familiar with some of the characteristics I'm going to talk about, but hopefully not all. Um, and it might even help you formulate some research questions of your own if, if, you're, if you're here from academia. So um, I'll break up the talk a little bit um, with a short demo midway through. And uh, given that we have an hour, um, I suspect there will be plenty of time um, left over for questions. Okay, so let me, before I dive into things, just let me take a step back. Um, I know other people on this webinar series have looked a little bit um, around energy history and, um, and this type of thing. Um, my personal journey, um, I first came across the field of natural language per processing in 2004 um, as an undergrad student. Um, and obviously, you know, a lot has changed um, in 20 years. So I put together a short timeline of a few events since then that have, have stuck in my mind. And look, please note that there is intentionally some bias in here as I'm highlighting some of the, the milestone in, in, in my personal journey, but also uh, you know a couple from Aria's history, just so you get some context. So as I said, my journey started around 2004, 2005. The thing that really inspired me was the um, Choosing Words in Computer Generated Forecasts paper by um, a Ahid Reiter et al. Uh, and really where they showed, um, you know, computers were capable of generating text from, from data that were of comparable quality to humans and even in some cases preferable um, to human experts. By, by human experts. So that's what kind of sparked my interest. Um, you know, I spent a few years um, in academia. Um, I was actually one of the founding group that spun out uh, a company called Data to Text Limited um, at the University of Aberdeen. And then kind of since then, um, you know, a lot of things have happened, right? I mean, there was a lot of hype around, um, you know, Watson winning Jeopardy, that always sticks in my mind from 2011, you know, um, Data to text was acquired 2013 fully by by Aria. Um, at the same time, you know, Google were publishing papers on distributional semantics. Uh, most people will be, I'm sure, aware of um, the word to vec paper. Um, and then, in kind of the mid 2010s, it got it got kind of interesting, right? So Gartner, the research company, predicted by 2018. You know, 20% of business content would be authored by machines. Um, I, I can't verify that um, prediction, but I think it was a pretty bold one back in 2015. And then 2016, Facebook launched um, chatbots on the Messenger platform. And you know, there's a huge amount of hype around that, um, a lot of excitement. Um, I think it didn't fully live up to the hype, but um, nonetheless, it was kind of, for me, a very... Um, important landmark. And then, of course, 2017, we got the, the Google Brain team published paper, uh, published a paper on transformer architecture, right? And, you know, ourselves, Aria 2018, we, we released our um, studio application. And also 2018, you know, the people were starting to talk about um, human parity um, from machine translation systems, at least at the census level. And that's really Again, along with the, the transform architecture paper in the previous year that really got um, me thinking around, you know, new energy, large language models. Fast forward, you know, Google adopted BERT as a language model for search. You know, OpenAI releases GPT-3 in 2020. And of course, everybody's fully aware, you know, in November 2022, OpenAI released um, ChatGPT. So just when I was thinking about this, talk, you know, I actually pulled some um, Google Trends um, data just on a, on a few different keywords. 
um, specifically natural language generation, text generation, and large language models. Um, kind of unsurprisingly, it shows a huge uptick in relative search popularity for the term large language models. Um, that co apologies for the quality of the graphic, but it, that coincides with the release of of, of ChatGPT there in November 2022. And then there's some more modest upticks for the keyword text generation and the keyword natural language generation. Um, that said, unfortunately, that surge in popularity was only fleeting, especially for natural language generation, it seems. But, you know, regardless um, of search terms, it's clear um, that the NLG market will continue to grow and at a much faster rate than analysts would have ever predicted a year ago, I think. Um, so I think one forecast I, I look back at from kind of mid 2022 estimated the NLG market to grow um, at a rate of 19.5% of from around half a billion in 2022 to around 2.7 billion in, in 2030. I think, and I'm, you know, I, I put my neck out there, I think it's definitely safe to assume that the growth will, will far exceed those, those type of forecasts now with um, the hype that's been generated around large language models. Um, and what's this all, what is this has also done has essentially created an increasingly crowded market um, for language technology. So this graphic is at the moment, I think everybody knows realizes that there are so many new um, startups coming into this space at the moment that you know it's, it's almost impossible to put it onto a single slide. But I think what's probably more interesting is, the lines are starting to blur a little bit between the capabilities offered by software vendors and more traditional software categories and pure language technology vendors. So, you know, we've seen that in business intelligent platforms where narrative summaries and conversational insights have essentially graduated from almost a nice to have feature to now a must have feature over recent years. Um, so as I said, this this landscape I just put up here is by no means exhausted. Um, it just attempts to capture the core categories and key players. Um, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the bottom right-hand corner. You can see um, specifically on data to text. And in that case, it's used to make the distinction between broad and niche data to text offerings, right? So in the broad sense, Vendors are providing tooling to build and deploy enterprise applications to a varied set of end user personas. While in the niche case, um, often more managed services are provided that include tooling to measure the impact of generated text in production. Um, and we see this, these types of examples often in uh, the consumer marketing space, for example. And then just to kind of reiterate the point, um, it's worth quickly expanding upon that definition of broad data to text by providing examples of some of the industries where we currently see adoption. Um, at ARIA, um, in particular, we serve customers in a wide variety of industry domains um, from finance, pharma, retail, and quick service restaurants with our, with our technology suite. Um, so the important thing here is to, to understand this requires a huge amount of flexibility in any core technology that you develop in, in order to be able to serve so many industries and use cases. And then finally, before I, I get into the seven characteristics, if we think about generative AI and LMs driving a lot of public interest in, um, in, in the technology right now, um, that's fine, but what has been the driver up until now, right? So in the enterprise use case, much of this has been around the automation of knowledge work. And in 2017, when McKinsey were defining the next generation target digital operating model, um, they identified natural language generation as one of the five key um, technologies to enable intelligent process automation. What's key to understand um, around this area, around the, the future of work and automation is that the anticipated um, automation is around routine tasks, not jobs, right? So it's, it's the percentage of routine tasks that can be automated 
and thus you know freeing humans to work on more high value tasks so the fact that NLG is seen as a key enabler of that transformation is and will continue to um, drive demand okay so I've talked a lot about market demand um, I'm now going to switch to um, data to text systems in particular and some of the characteristics that drive adoption and ultimately make them valuable for end users. Okay, so characteristic number one. So outputs are trustworthy. Um, so I think everybody in the audience should be well aware of these concepts, um, even if you might characterize them slightly different if you're coming from research, um, etc. But Ultimately, they're fundamental to user acceptance of data to text systems. And perhaps they've come further under the spotlight with the, the advent of neural approaches to NLG, um, for sure. On, on, the, on the output accuracy consideration, for safety critical applications, there is no room for error, right? That, that, that's clear. Output should be 100% accurate, although you know, some consumer applications may be more, more lenient. And I've given some, some examples there of emissions, hallucinations, and, and confusions. Um, on the consistency side, you know, you can see inconsistencies in data to text system output. They can occur in both um, rules-based and neural, especially when, in the rule-based case, subsequent inputs might oscillate around either side of, of, of static thresholds. Um, but we can also see this um, in model-based systems where a slight variation in prompts or data distribution shift in the, in the training data um, can cause inconsistencies. The key thing here is the ability to be able to track back those consistencies, make them audible and um, you know, rectify them in a, in a prompt uh, manner. Um, on the ethical side, yeah, I think this has really come to the fore with the use of large language models, um, and especially in terms of, of bias amplification, one might argue, carbon footprint and fair use of content. Um, I won't touch further on this right now. Um, I'll, you know, I'll discuss a little bit further on in the talk. Um, so look, so without debating the merits of different approaches to energy here, I think what is most interesting um, is how hybrid approaches will develop as rules and templates, you know, won't go away, as I say, because they bring um, audibility and traceability to, to the whole process and essentially make um, the ability for systems to be um, deterministic. And then, you know, just a short point, I think, you know, everybody's been, you know, reading the news you know, output errors can be be very costly. And, you know, just to emphasize the point, you know, we've seen some costly errors recently in the news due to um, chat optimized LLMs, right? Um, despite the advancements in, in output quality due to approaches such as RLHF. So I'm just, you know, specifically pulled out the, the Google Bard um, example and um, a recent example of um, a New York lawyer who was using ChatGPT for, for his legal research. So that's characteristic number one. Let's look at characteristic number two. Um, outputs are controllable. Okay. So this characteristic follows on from accuracy, right? So if undesirable system output occurs, as we've seen in the past from some publicly available chatbots, um, you know, specifically, you know, 2016, um, you know, the Tay chatbot um, deployed by Microsoft um, springs to mind. But if, but if this situation occurs, you know, changes need to be applied quickly um, or the system must be taken offline. So in the case of black box models, um, you know, this is not straightforward. And, you know, there, if it has potentially um, lengthy training iterations, you know, this, is, this, is, uh, this can be a problem. But... You know, over and above that, if the goal is for users to ultimately go beyond just adopting the system and actually becoming self-sufficient, i.e. making output changes um, themselves, um, the process should be clear and, and easy to implement. Okay, 
Okay, so characteristic number three. Insights go beyond just describing data. So at this point, I just want to give you a couple of examples. Um, in this example, we're looking at um, a mobile app in a quick service restaurant designed to help to drive profitability within a, within a store for, for a manager. Um, so on the left-hand side is a long-form data-driven narrative designed to describe the current state of the day's operations. And as a part of that, we're providing a recommendation um, to actually increase the staffing within the store to meet heightened demand. Um, so in this case, we are going beyond just describing the data, but in order to be effective, it's also important to follow up and notify an end user of the impact of any actions taken. So in this case, it's, it's also provided um, as a push notification later on in the day we've detected that, yes, you've acted upon our recommendation, you know, here's the impact of that recommendation. So this is quite a complex example and challenging in the fact that, you know, we have, we're talking about a lot of context um, that might not necessarily be readily available in the data. So I want to then move on to another example which is um, uh, our area investment analyst um, product and just give a very short um, example of adding context to data-driven narrative right to help and uh, an end user understand why um, things are changing in a port um, stock portfolio report so at this point i'm going to just switch Over here and yeah please bear with me this is um you know this is a live demo so i'm, I'm just hoping that uh the um the internet connection holds out and we, we, we get uh, we don't get any latency but just to be clear um th this demo um is not something um we actually sell this is this is just a, a demo that we we show to clients um, but on the back end, we're actually using um, our APIs from our technology suite. And um, what you're looking at right now is um, a web interface that provides access to um, performance data on um, equity stocks. Right? And the idea here is we want to provide um, fund commentary um, reporting and automate that process. So I'm going to go ahead and load some data. And just to be clear, what, what I'm uploading here is these five files are the performance data of a uh, stock portfolio, and it's broken down by um, different dimensions. So at the top level, we have a portfolio, uh, and then it's broken down into sectors, sub-industries, countries, and the actual securities um, themselves. And then we also have a human-written example of um, a market overview. So I'm actually just going to upload that data. I'm going to click on configure. Um, then what I have here on the left-hand side is a configuration panel. I'm going to choose my portfolio. I'm going to choose a uh, start and end date of a period. And then I'm going to select um, a dimension that, you know, basically we want to analyze this portfolio through. So in this case, um, I'm going to choose sector. I'm going to then click on um, these three different lenses. And we produce a, um, a fun commentary. Now, as I mentioned before, um, we actually have um, a different, um, different types of text being produced on the screen here. So we have um, handwritten um, human text by um, an asset manager who's going to write, write a, a market overview. We then have data-driven narrative that we can look at the performance of the portfolio through different lenses. Um, the first being just a, a short summary, talking about um, the performance of the fund during the period. 
we're then going into a key drivers lens, which is talking about um, components of the por portfolio within um, the, how, the, how the selection and attribution decisions impact the portfolio at different uh, within different sectors, right? So information technology um, had a, a positive allocation effect, as well as our selection decisions in in, uh, in real estate. And then finally, we're giving um, more detail here at the end. So at the actual um, security level, so you know what stocks are driving um, the the portfolio performance. And then just to give you some more insight, I can click through. Um, and we're providing more out-of-the-box insights that's fully configurable. So I can ask to, instead of showing just the top three um, performing stocks, we can show the top five. Um, we can also change um, the way we look at the portfolio. So right now we're just describing the overall net effects of performance. We can actually ask to look at the, the allocation selection decisions. Give me a second it's just while this loads. So as I said, this is this is live. We're actually interacting with um, our backend APIs to provide out of the box insights. Um, we can also um, create what we call dynamic groups by actually um, filtering on the different dimensions. So I wanted to remove cash from this analysis. Again, um, the report will will generate on the fly. So if I go back to um, going our characteristic, right, which is going beyond just describing data, um, how can um, a human in the loop, um, how, how can a human interact with the system just beyond um, you know, descriptions of, of the performance? So just very quickly, um, I could click on a link on a specific um, stock and we can go out and we can um, essentially do a search on trusted sources of information in this case um, you know Bloomberg for example Reuters and other news sources if you wanted to add them and essentially provide the news articles for the period that um, a human analyst can use to essentially get further insight in a more context into what is happening. So there's um, a number of steps that could be taken here. Um, I'm not going to go through it, but just to kind of emphasize the point of an example of getting more context. And then from here, optionally, you know, they could read the articles themselves, you know, add some more um, flavor to um, the, the commentary, or, you know, even look at using some text to text functionality to create a, a small summary. Okay, so at this point, um, I should have mentioned, you know, it's also, if there are any questions, are we, are we going to leave them to the end? Or do, do any, does anybody have questions right now? I should ask you, Raquel, in that case. We usually wait if someone has questions. You will leave them to the end? Yeah, we usually do that. Okay, okay, very good. Okay, so, um, so just on the topic of, you know, going beyond describing just, just the data. So if we now look at some of the other benefits of data set systems, right? If you're aware, you know, Gartner research company was talking about the concept of data literacy. So um, basically we're saying, you know, by 2023, data literacy will become an explicit and necessary driver of business value just demonstrated by its formal inclusion over 80% of data analytics strategy and change management programs. So where does um, autom automated text generation um, come into it through data to text systems, right? So Gardner explicitly defines data literacy as the ability to read, write, and communicate data in context, right? And including an understanding of data sources and constructs, analytical methods and techniques applied. So, um, if we look at that under underlined phrase there, communicate data in context, um, 
we can think about um, narrative as providing that context and the benefit being that if we have more um, data literate organizations you know what benefit does that provide so end users um, are better enabled or empowered to ask questions of the data they are more empowered to test their own hypothesis and also you know they can communicate a um, clear and consistent message um, throughout their organization so you know what we really see is you know um, analytics charts graphs and whether that be in dashboards or other reporting systems augmented with narrative um, really is an enabler right for, for providing um, or communicating data in context and ultimately it also opens up the opportunity for um, self-service reporting right so if we can provide um, explainable insights um, we can increase the adoption and retention of reporting tools such as dashboards by enhancing their value and increasing their overall return on investment um, as i said already we can ensure the knowledge can be disseminated across the organization in a clear and consistent manager in uh, manner apologies but most importantly um, we can enable um, faster um, more confident localized decision making which ultimately enables better decision outcomes okay so that was going beyond just describing data and adding context um, characteristic four catering for different end user personas so if we look at most real world deployments of um, data to tech systems um, they often embed in you know very complex environments and that can lead to um, a diverse set of um, end users right so often um, when we evaluate um, data to tech systems you know, we think a lot are up about um, output quality um, specifically and specifically the the end consumer but um, as I said, if we keep on the definition of providing you know, a broad um, capability, there's actually a number of different personas there um, that need to be catered for. So, I mean, I've just highlighted a few of the main personas that we encounter. You know, if I start from the top left, um, you know, we have pro developers who, you know, ultimately are most interested in um, becoming self-sufficient building their own systems with a with a toolkit um, they're they're focused on customizing output they're focused on deployment and they need you know tooling um, such as libraries in order to make them de develop faster but there's also another class um, of user right and um, you know we talk about them as, as citizen developers right and they're mostly looking for um, out of the box insights, um, like I showed uh, kind of briefly in, in the demo before in financial services, um, and no code, you know, low code solutions, lots of parameter configuration, and in some cases also um, some co authoring and, and, and writing assistance. So that's very much on the side of end users who are, um, you know, creating reports, um, et cetera, not consuming them. But in between, you know, there's also a class of you know end users um, who you know might be looking um, to moderate output. Um, so, for example, if we go back to you know financial services, you know we have people looking at you know regulatory risk uh, and, and and client uh, compliance. So apologies. So you know there are approvers. They they want to follow guidelines. Output you know might have to change um, according to those guidelines. So again, 
it comes back to you know characteristic number two outputs are controllable and you should be able to react to change very quickly um, your next persona I have in there is uh, content editors again you know they might want to post edit um, the output they want to ensure quality assurance and then obviously for them you know version control is is very important so Again, lots of different considerations that you have to take into account that is brought on by this kind of diverse set of um, potential end users. So, um, characteristic number five, um, easily integrate into operational workflows. So this actually um, follows on a little bit um, from the from the last characteristic I talked about, um, essentially, when these systems are being used, you know, there's a clear um, understanding around, you know, the operational workflow that has to be um, carried out, and you know, there's at a very very high level, there's a differentiation between are we looking at end to end process automation or you know are there going to be humans in the loop that will be interacting with the system so if we just stick on the left hand side um, you know end-to-end -end process automation we're looking at a system that after user acceptance testing is intended to run in, in perpetuity and, and unattended right that brings its challenges um, specifically you know we need to think about you know, automated regression and, and sanity checks and you know in case of um, if there's a model being used um, you know data distribution shifts as I already talked about and you know obviously it, there's more emphasis from a um, and then user persona level of pro developers and citizen developers in this case on the human in the loop side you know the system is embedding into a wider overall workflow to increase human productivity right that brings again its own set of challenges more specifically you know we need to think about you know does does the system output and um, does it have to be persisted for all users for you know kind of very um you know basic um design decisions um but probably more importantly you know human computer action interaction really starts to play a part right if you've got you know users who um, are making edits or you have approvers that are ensuring um, you know compliance okay so characteristic number six generated insights are explainable so I think this is um, a big topic um, that I think is only you know really just starting to um, to get going, but um, I think for um, data sex systems now, you know, we'll need to start thinking about the fact that you know insights and decisions need to be justifiable to, to third parties, right? So, in the decision support context, the outputs need to be audible, auditable, and the systems have to be explainable. So. You know, Gartner, the research company, is now predicting that organizations who apply this concept of um, AI trust, risk, and security management, which they call AI TRISM, and they're basically predicting that, you know, organizations that will implement that and they will attain better outcomes in terms of their adoption of their AI systems um, if they implement um, this trust, risk, and security management. So this is a um, big topic. It's really, I think, breaking new ground with um, all the technology advancements and the hype that we're seeing at the moment. Um, but I think it's important to note that you know, there's legislation um, in the works that essentially go far beyond um, you know, data privacy regulations such as um, the GDPR. right? Um, Especially um, in the European Union, I think their their most um, the most far advanced um, kind of geographic area in terms of um, implementing 
um, an act on, on regulating artificial intelligence. Um, so if you look at that, obviously it's still um, being debated as we, as we speak, but they're taking this risk-based approach um, to AI regulation. And you know, part of that is bringing in transparency measures um, such as disclosures for AI generated content and, and copyright, copyrighted content used in training models. Um, so I think this is going to have um, the biggest impact probably in consumer facing um, outputs, but something definitely um, I think everybody researchers and industry has to has to keep an eye on right now. Okay, so characteristic number seven, um, evaluation takes operational impact into account. So what does that mean? And I think I kind of mentioned earlier on in the in the talk that you know evaluation should go beyond um, you know just looking at output quality in terms of um, the end user or the end consumer of the of the output. Um, specifically, when we're building systems, you know, we really need to ask, you know, a few fundamental questions, right? So do, do, does the output drive positive business outcomes, right? Can the narrative impact other business critical metrics? And I'll, I'll, I'll give a couple of examples after, after this slide. Um, of course, things like, you know, what are change management consist, um, considerations? You know, what's the cost of, you know, potentially generating misleading output. Um, and as I mentioned already in terms of, you know, users becoming or adopting the software and uh, essentially becoming self-sufficient, you know, can the end users operate the system and, and, and make changes themselves? So these are all considerations that have to go in beyond just purely evaluating a system based on an output quality. So I thought, um, I'd finish off with a couple of examples from actually systems that um, we've published um, in the NOG literature, um, specifically in the weather forecasting domain. So um, as I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk, um, you know, I was really inspired by some of the results um, we saw in, in, in the weather forecasting domain around 2005 when um, end users judged um, you know, computer-generated text to be preferable um, to humans and, and uh, human-generated text in limited domains. And, you know, part of my own work, part of my own PhD, um, you know, we looked at um, generating road um, weather forecasts for, for road safety in road gritting applications in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and we built a system that essentially generated uh, weather forecast for thousands of data points um, across the road network and the idea was to provide more detailed instructions for people operating the, the sorting and gridding operations. Um, so essentially enable them to avoid environmental waste and um, you know excess expense in terms of their the salt and gritting um, operations. So um, for me, it was quite exciting at the time. Um, you know, we did we did some evaluation, um, and we found um, you know clear preferences for the generated text over human author forecast, forecast when we we um, evaluated them side by side. Um, but unfortunately, when we actually asked them, okay, how would you change your operational procedures? Um, you know, there was no um, no positive positive change coming from the the actual generated text. So again, like I said, just trying to make it clear that you know just evaluating on on the output quality um, has it has its pitfalls. Um, again, just another example um, from a, a system published in in the literature. Again, in the domain of um, weather forecasting. Um, you know, this is a system um, a few colleagues and I, we, we built and actually deployed um, onto um, the Met Office uh, beta uh, website back in 2014. And there we were essentially scaling uh, manual processes of, of weather forecasters. So back then they had 
I think 5,000 data points, weather data points for the UK, site-specific weather forecasts, but they only had enough um, human weather forecasters to uh, write area-based uh, weather forecasts. So the, on, the, on the slide it says 10,000, so we actually did look at the, the data worldwide, um, but the specific business application was looking at the United Kingdom, which had 5,000. But the point was we were able with this system to generate 10,000 human quality forecasts at 95 seconds. And we did an evaluation on the output quality, which was um, extremely positive. Um, but now um, it seems quite ironic to me, um, you know, the timing. Um, you know, remember this was 2014. Um, Google was um, deploying their Pandas update to their um, search algorithm. So um, they were essentially penalizing automated content online, right, as part of their the search algorithm. And this made, um, you know, search engine marketers extremely, extremely nervous. And, um, you know, the thought of putting, you know, 10,000 uh, automated pieces of content on, on their website, you know, they really weren't... Um, sure what would happen to you know their seo rankings for their pages so at that time we didn't move forward despite again you know showing that you can automate a process scale a process from, from from end to end and you know just on that topic of um you know economic impact and evaluation if you're interested um you know we do have um, a Forrester study online on aria.com. Um, you can use the QR code there in the slide, um, and you know you can take a look at um, you know some of the um, the Forrester work they looked at um, a total economic impact study of of Aria natural language generation. Okay, um, so I think we're going to have plenty of time um, for questions. Um, you know, just to, to finish up here, okay, so I've gone through, you know, seven characteristics of highly effective data tech systems. You know, if we're looking forward now, um, as I mentioned already at the beginning of the talk, NLG is, you know, is now an established so software category for some time. Um, in terms of, you know, the future, you know, some of the predictions around you know, the growth of the generative AI market. Bloomberg is predicting that, you know, generative AI is going to go from 40 billion in 2022 to $1.3 trillion uh, market in 2032. I think there's, um, it's a very, very exciting time to be involved in, in NLG and, and, you know, the broader NLP space. Um, you know, data tech systems make up a significant portion of that market, providing reliable, safety-critical applications of AI and it's going to be exciting I think you know there'll be some challenges you know there's some pending AI regulation coming um, you know which will make operating environments increasingly complex but a um, you know, very exciting time to be involved in the field thank you